friends planning an event. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 6. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 6. Hello, Joan. I'm glad you could come. Hello, Peter. What's up? Is something the matter? No, no. Everything's fine. It sounded urgent on the phone. Did it? It's just that I've had this idea, and I wanted to see how soon we could get it off the ground. Well, don't keep me in suspense. You know they're planning to close down the local clinic. It was in the newspaper yesterday, but most people have actually known for some time. Well, I thought we should do something about it. What did you have in mind? I thought we could organise a charity event and donate the money to the clinic. I know it doesn't sound like much, but it will show the local council how we feel and that we mean business. That'll take quite a lot of organising. Why don't we just hold a protest outside the town hall? A protest would take just as much organisation as an event like this. Besides, I think fewer people would turn up. A village fair, or something like that, would attract more people and get money for the clinic. People are more generous when they're enjoying themselves. OK, then. It sounds good to me. How do we start? First, we put our heads together and come up with a list of people who'll be willing to help and people who can provide us with some of the things we need. For example, we might need a caterer to provide refreshments, a rock band for entertainment, tents and so on. Then, we do a lot of telephoning around and try to get everybody together at the same time, in the same place. Sounds like a lot of work to me. But that's only the beginning. First things first, though. Let's decide now on who to get to the initial meeting and where and when to hold it. Fine. Well, the village hall would be the best place to have the meeting. It's not as big as the youth club, but it's warmer. There'll be no problem getting permission to use it, but I suppose it depends on how many people we invite. We don't want too many, otherwise the meeting will go on too long and nothing will get decided. But the village hall is a good idea. It's more official than having it in someone's living room. How many? Six or eight people to start with? Ten at the most? OK. Now we have to decide on a suitable day and time. Suitable to everybody, I mean. A Saturday or Sunday would seem to be the best choice because people aren't at work on those days. But they may not like the idea of giving up a part of their weekend for a meeting. Unless we persuade them it's for a good cause, or that it's to their advantage, and that it'll all be a lot of fun. We'll provide refreshments, of course. What if some don't want to give up their weekend? Then we'll give them an alternative. Say, one evening in the week after everybody's finished work. We'll see which is the most acceptable to them. Then book the hall. I can do the refreshments for the meeting. I'll get Darren and Maggie to help me. I'm sure they'll be more than willing. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 7 to 10. 
So, what's next on the agenda? A list of who we want at the meeting. Yes, of course. Obviously, we want someone from the clinic. I think Dr. Perkins would be best. He can tell us exactly what the financial situation is there. You know, how much money it takes to keep the place running, and how important it is for the community to have the clinic. The vicar, too. He can rally lots of support. And Mr. Sims, our member of parliament. He is very busy, but I think I can persuade him to come, or get his wife to persuade him to come. I see her quite a lot socially. That's great. Two other people I have in mind are Freddie Smith. The journalist? Yes. Well, he's the editor of the local paper now and might be useful. He might let us advertise for free and he'll know how to go about getting leaflets and posters printed. That's another thing. We'll need volunteers to put leaflets through people's doors and stick up posters all over the place. We can decide that at the meeting. What about the other person? What other person? You said you had two people in mind, Freddie Smith and... Oh, yes, Mr Gates. Mr Gates. Do I know him? You must do. He owns Greatfields Farm. We need a large area to hold the fate. Right. So how many have we got then? Seven or eight? There's Dr Perkins, Mr Sims, that journalist... Freddie Smith, you mean? Yes, him. And the vicar and Mr Gates, the farmer. That's only five. There's you and me. That's seven. That will do for now. Let's start making phone calls. That is the end of section one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Part 2. You will hear a talk by a wildlife specialist on a type of bird called a kiwi. First, look at questions 11 to 15. As you listen to the first part of the talk, answer questions 11 to 15. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Auckland Zoo on this sunny Sunday afternoon and to our special Kiwi fundraising event. My job is to tell you all about the amazing little Kiwi and your job, hopefully, is to dig deep in your pockets. <laughs> Now, for the benefit of our overseas visitors here today, I should explain first of all that the kiwi is the national bird of New Zealand, and sometimes New Zealanders themselves are known as kiwis. Now, while kiwis in the wild are a rare sight, the kiwi as a symbol is far more visible. Apart from being in toy stores and airport shops all over the world, you'll find them on our stamps and coins. The kiwi is the smallest member of the genus Apteryx, which also includes ostriches and emu. It gets its name from its shrill call, which sounds very much like this. Kiwi! Kiwi! Kiwis live in forests or swamps and feed on insects, worms, snails and berries. It's a nocturnal bird with limited sight, and therefore it has to rely on its very keen sense of smell to find food and to sense danger. Its nostrils are actually right on the end of its long beak, which is one third of the body length. Now, here's an interesting fact. Although kiwis have wings, they serve little purpose. 
because the kiwi is a flightless bird. Since white settlement of the islands, kiwi numbers have dropped from 12 million to less than 70,000. And our national bird is rapidly becoming an endangered species. This is because they're being threatened by what we call introduced animals. Animals which were brought to New Zealand, such as cats and ferrets, which eat kiwi eggs and their chicks. Now look at questions 16 to 20. As the talk continues, answer questions 16 to 20. And so we have launched the Kiwi Recovery Program in an all-out effort to save our national bird from extinction. There are three stages to this program. Firstly, we have the scientific research stage. This involves research to find out more about what Kiwis need to survive in the wild. Then secondly, we have the action stage. This is where we go into the field and actually put our knowledge to work. We call this putting science into practice. And then we come to the third stage, the global education stage. By working with schools and groups like yourself, as well as through our award-winning Kiwi website, we are hoping to educate people about the plight of the Kiwi. As part of the action stage, which I just mentioned, we've introduced Operation Nest Egg, and this is where your money will be going. It works like this. It's a three-stage process. First of all, we go out to the kiwi's natural habitat and we collect kiwi eggs. This is the tricky part, because it can be very difficult to find the eggs. Then, in safe surroundings, away from predators, the chicks are reared. Now, this can be done on predator-free islands or in captivity. They're reared until they're about nine months old, at which stage the chicks are returned to the wild. So far, it's proving successful. And since we started the program, some 34 chicks have been successfully raised this year and their chances of survival have increased from 5 to 85 percent. However, it's not time to celebrate kiwi survival just yet. About 95 percent of kiwi chicks still don't make it to six months of age without protection. Which is why Operation Nest Egg is so important. And we ask you to give generously today. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. In section three, you will hear a conversation about shopping. Masahiro is an international student who has just arrived from Japan, and Anna and Will are doing some shopping with him. You have some time to read questions 21 to 26 first.
Listen to the first part of the conversation now and answer questions twenty-one to twenty-six. Here we are, guys. I'm going to stop by Bergner's first. I might just get lucky today. Who knows? Some of their dresses might be on sale. Bergner's. It's a fairly well-known department store, sort of like Penny's. They've got some quality stuff. Do you want to check it out? Why not? I need to get something for Lisa's birthday. She's into name brands. Any suggestions? A Gucci handbag or a Calvin Klein T-shirt might be nice. Designer perfume is another option. Which reminds me, I have a fifteen percent discount coupon for Learners and Pennies. I hardly ever shop at Learners. I'm not that big on women's clothing. I rarely shop at Pennies. So go ahead and use the coupon if you can. Here they are. Thanks a lot, Will. That's really very thoughtful of you. My pleasure, ma'am. Oh no! I was supposed to give Liz a buzz an hour ago. Hope I have a quarter. Need a nickel? Actually, I don't have anything but pennies in change. Does any of you have a dollar in change? Sorry, I don't. But I do have thirty-five cents on me. Will that be okay for the phone call? Great! I really appreciate it. I'll make it quick. Do you guys want to go ahead? Well, wait. Just don't forget us. I won't. Why don't we just meet here in thirty minutes? Sounds good. I guess I'll just look around. Can I help you, sir? No thanks. I'm just looking. Well, just out of curiosity, how much is that necklace? Twenty nine ninety nine. Really? My sister's birthday is tomorrow. She loves jewellery. I just wasn't sure I could afford it. You'll find that a lot of our stuff is amazingly affordable. Well, that's certainly nice to know. I'll take it. It's a good choice. I'm sure she'll love it. Let's hope so. Cash or charge, sir?、Uh, charge, please. Do you accept, Discoverer? Yes, we do. Great. That comes to thirty-one ninety-nine with tax. Please sign next to X. Do you need some help, sir? Well, I'm looking for. Let's see. I've forgotten the name again. It's used to make fresh coffee. A coffee maker. That's right. Well, we have a few in kitchenware, which is upstairs. Thank you. You're welcome. Oh, there you are, Masha Hero. What did you get? Just a simple coffee maker. Good choice. And you will find anything interesting? A necklace for Stephanie's birthday. Lucky her. Did you get anything? Just a couple of silly earrings that I liked. I did a lot of window shopping. That can't hurt. True. Well, do you guys need anything else from this place? One last thing. Oh no, I've forgotten what you call it. Just describe it, and we'll probably figure out what it's called. It's a crystal container for flowers with long stems. I need to get one for my mum. Oh, a vase. That's it. They should have a bunch in giftware. Let's go to get one. I'm going to have to stop by Jewel on my way home. Is that okay with you guys? I'm almost completely out of groceries. No problems. I could pick up a couple of things too. Look at questions twenty-seven to thirty. Now you will hear the rest of the conversation. As you listen, answer questions number twenty-seven to thirty. Hi, Masha Hero. How's it going? Fine, I guess. How about you? Busy. Guess who's coming our way? Hi, guys. What's up? Nothing much. We just ran into each other. That's nice. So, Masha Hero, how's the coffee maker working? Actually, it doesn't work well. It was a waste of money. I guess I should have shopped around for a good one. Why don't you take it back? I'd like to, but I've misplaced the receipt. Well, if it's any consolation, my shopping wasn't all that great either. I wish I'd never bought Stephanie a necklace. Just last night, she was telling me how she wished she had Liz Taylor's new perfume.
She did not like my gift at all. That makes three displeased shoppers. Guess what? The camera I bought and shipped to Mike just this morning is now on sale. It's a pity that I bought it then. Then again, I guess I shouldn't complain. It was a good buy, even though I didn't get the best deal on it. Anyway, Mashahiro, I suggest you look for that receipt and just go to the complaints department and say, "I'd like to exchange this, please." It's as simple as that. And Will, it's not too late for you to ask for a refund. That is the end of section three. You now have thirty seconds to check your answers. To part four. Part four. You will hear part of a lecture about the school calendar. Listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to forty. So, having seen that the six-term system has passed the test of cost-effectiveness, we can move on to the educational aspects of this arrangement. Firstly, all the terms would be approximately the same length. Instead of terms up to thirteen weeks, which we have now, there could be a repeating pattern of seven weeks of term time plus two weeks of vacation. This would be repeated six times per year. How does this affect the effectiveness of the educational provision? The most noticeable result would be that the very long summer holiday would be reduced in length. This byproduct of the six-term system could be beneficial. There's plenty of evidence of huge learning loss by pupils during the summer holidays. By learning loss, we mean the amount that pupils forget or lose during a holiday break. Ashley carried out a number of analyses which showed this conclusively. He investigated thirty-nine studies examining the effects of summer holidays on standardized test scores. His analyses indicated that summer learning loss equaled two weeks to seven weeks of instruction. On average, children's test scores were three weeks lower than when they left school in the previous term. He also found differences in the learning loss effect according to subject. The subjects he analysed were reading, writing, and maths, and he found that the effect was greatest in maths and reading. Furthermore, although all social groups experienced roughly similar learning loss in the field of maths, the studies found that disadvantaged children showed even greater losses in reading skills. So. The problem of learning loss in traditional schools is clear. However, the results of studies into the six-term system and learning loss are ambiguous. Marchmont found that pupils in six-term schools maintained their test scores after the shorter holiday period. This is certainly an improvement on the traditional system, where, as we have seen, pupils perform worse after the summer break. Benson, however, found no differences between those in traditional schools and on the six-term schedule. It would seem reasonable that if long holidays result in learning loss, then shorter holidays should result in less learning loss. So we await the outcome of further studies. Historically, of course, everyone knows the reason for our system of three terms per year. In days when agriculture was of much greater importance in our working lives, it was essential that the children helped with the harvest. Later on, this changed, and more people moved into the towns. But then there was a new problem: before air conditioning, it was very impractical to try to teach children in the summer months. Nowadays, that's no longer a barrier. One way of providing something different is the summer school. 
Here, there is a completely different kind of educational provision. Cooper and others investigated 93 summer schools and the results they achieved. They all had a positive effect on learning. Most summer schools, of course, have small classes and class size was shown to have a positive effect. Additionally, summer school children usually benefit from a great deal of parental support, not least because payment of fees is involved, and this, as so often, was shown to produce very good outcomes. Results were most impressive, in maths in general. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.